Hello, and welcome to the Surfaces tutorial. QLab uses an idea called surfaces to connect video cues to devices, such as projectors, monitors, or LED panels. By using surfaces as an intermediary step, instead of connecting cues directly to outputs, QLab can offer a level of flexibility that would not otherwise be possible. When you create a new workspace, QLab automatically generates one surface for each display that's connected to your Mac. For example, this MacBook Pro has two display devices connected to it, a 1920 by 1080 external monitor. Dude, I got a Dell. Okay. And also a 1280 by 720 projector. So a new workspace created on this Mac will have three surfaces automatically created. One for the built-in display, one for the monitor, and one for the projector. You'll see those three surfaces listed in Preferences under Video. Let's click on the Edit button for the surface associated with the built-in screen to open the Surface Editor. Welcome to the Surface Editor. We're not going to lie, there's a lot going on here. We'll walk you through the elements of the Surface Editor one by one. Let's start in the upper left-hand corner. The surface name, which defaults to Surface 1 in this case, can be customized to anything you like. To the right side of the name, you'll see that the dimensions of this default surface match the dimensions of the screen. So, since the MacBook Pro's display appears to the system as a 1440 by 900 screen, that's what QLab uses as the default size for the surface. You can change this, and we'll get into why you might want to do that in the next tutorial. The column on the left side of the window shows the list of screens assigned to the surface. You can see Color LCD right there, with a reminder of its resolution. And this, what happens when I click Grid? Whoa! Don't worry. This is a test. This is only a test. When you click Grid, QLab shows this grid on the selected display. We'll use it more when we get into keystone correction, warping, and mapping. How do I get out of here? Just hit Escape. We'll talk about the Guides checkbox in the Surface Mapping tutorial. Below the list of screens is a plus button to assign a screen to this surface, a minus button to remove the selected screen, and a Replace Screen drop-down menu. To swap out one screen for another, select the screen you wish to replace and choose a new screen from the drop-down menu. This is dense. It is. But most of these controls are for specific situations. If you don't need to swap a projector, you won't need to use the Replace Screen button. So, you can get a handle on each feature one at a time and build your understanding as you need to. Below these buttons are controls to set the position of the screen within the surface. You can slide the screen left to right, and up to down. You can set the screen to Rear Project, and you can rotate the screen in 90 degree increments. This can be useful if your screen or projector is mounted upside down or in portrait orientation. That's cool, but why would I want to move it left to right or up and down? Well, there's not much reason to until we start talking about surfaces with more than one screen. You mean two screens on one surface? What are we waiting for? Well, there's this other tutorial we keep mentioning called Surface Mapping which is dedicated to multi-screen surfaces, mapping, and fancy stuff like that. So you can skip ahead if you're ready, or finish out this tutorial first. I guess, uh, I guess Luke's off to go find that, to go find that other tutorial. So I'll just, um, I guess I'll just continue on by myself. The center of the Surface Editor shows your screen in a color and the surface in white. If they're the same size, like in this surface, that might not be obvious at first, but if you drag the screen aside, you'll be able to see it. Option clicking on the origin controls down in the lower left will recenter your screen. If the screen needs perspective correction, and you have a Pro Video or Pro Bundle license installed, you can click and drag on any of the corners of the screen to make adjustments.
Clicking Reset Control Points, also in the lower left corner, will undo all changes. On the right side of the window, you'll find Warp Type, which can be set to Perspective Warping, Linear Warping, or Bezier Warping. As it turns out, this will come in quite handy when you want to continue learning about mapping and spreading a surface across multiple screens. Welcome back. The next control, Constraints, is a way of trimming down a surface without distorting it. The most useful way to think of this is to imagine setting up surfaces for a wall with a door in it. The projector points at the whole wall. Surface A is set up to allow you to project an image on the whole wall. You then make a copy of surface A and call it surface B, and then constrain surface B so that it only projects on the door. This is a great example of the power of surfaces. A cue can be assigned to project either on the full wall or just the door, simply by choosing the appropriate surface. The next button is labeled Add Split. At first, you'll see that a screen only has four control points with which to warp it, one in each corner. If you need more points, like if you're projecting onto an object, you can add a split to your surface. New control points appear at each end of the split, and that allows you to shape the surface exactly as you need it. You can add as many splits, either horizontally or vertically, as you need. To delete a split, Click on it, then click on the X. Now, Blend Gamma is another one of those things that only matters when you're combining multiple screens. So we'll leave it alone for now. Surfaces have layers too, just like cues. Surface layers, however, supersede cue layers. So if surface A and surface B both use the same screen, and surface B is set to a higher layer, then all the cues on surface B will appear on top of all the cues on surface A. Masks can be used to customize the shape of your projection. If you want your surface to be round, you can use a mask to frame it. If you want to block your projected image from an obstruction or from bleeding onto an unwanted piece of scenery, you can create a mask to achieve that. A mask is simply a grayscale image. Where the image is white, your cues will show through. Where the image is black, your cues will be blocked. Black means transparent, so lower layered surfaces are still visible. Below the mask control are duplicate checkboxes for guides and grid. and an invert checkbox to show the grid as white on black instead of black on white. There's also a button to save the grid as an image in order to use it as a starting point to build your mask. Finally, the ID number of the surface is displayed in the bottom right corner. You'll need this number if you want to refer to this surface in Apple scripts or OSC commands. As with all things relating to video, the key to success is taking your time and experimenting. When you're ready for more, check out the tutorial for surface mapping.